So uh, welcome back to week four. And we're, I just want to start out with some announcements. Um, so just one, I just wanted to make one announcement about attendance. Um, I apologize if you didn't, um, if your attendance wasn't accounted for a week. Um, I realized that we inadvertently had pasted the wrong link to the wrong survey. So if you were confused why it looked different, that was the reason why. Um, I basically imported all of the responses from that survey. Um, and I think I have, um, I've counted the attendance correctly for everyone. So check your, check your attendance score in the grade book. And if it's wrong, please let me know and I will fix it. Um, okay, and then um, just for, for, future, for future reference, um, this is going to be, this is the link to the survey. So I just made a short link just so it's completely unambiguous as to what the survey is. Um, and Eric will send that link out when he has it, when he um, sends out announcements. Okay. So um, speaking of Eric, assignment two has been returned. Um, are there any questions on it? Nothing? Okay. Well, um, I just want to, and I don't want to belabor this point too much, but um, we do, we do want, I do want you to really check your data types when you are loading in the data. Um, is there a question? Oh, Eric, okay, I will make you a uh, co-host and I will make you recording. So we're, we're already recording, Eric, so. Got it. Thanks. Um, okay, so I'm just going. I just I just want to really kind of emphasize this that um, kind of the sooner that you kind of deal with data issues um, in your process, the easier it is going to be to deal with them. So um, just a second. So this is Eric's assignment key. So really, um, we just noticed a lot of, and we tried to give you an opportunity to fix this. But remember when we were dealing with um, loading data um, with read Excel, that you have to set this NA argument. Otherwise, if argument, the, the columns that have NA in them are going to be read as characters. So you need to let R know what um, the representation for the missing value is. Um, so Eric did point out, so if you don't, if you don't do that, um, you'll notice that you have a lot more character variables and you only have three numeric variables here. So age of diagnosis, it, days to birth and cigarettes per day. And um, I, we asked a question about year to death, and you can see that year to death, because we didn't specify NA here, is a character. Um, you can do quite a bit with characters, but again, you, I you'd rather they be numeric, especially if you're trying to figure out what is the most, um, you know, any sort of any sort of like measurements based on year. So maybe you were trying to aggregate. Um, aggregate like total number of cigarettes per year or something like that. So having making sure um, making sure and doing your homework and checking the data type is really important. Um, are there any questions about this? Just really quick for the when you set the sure. end when you're importing data for read Excel function. Mm -hmm. Whatever you set NA to, that's what it becomes. So if I set it to nothing, like if I just double quotes, mm -hmm. it'll populate as a blank cell or null value. Yeah. So this is this kind of gets back to formatting formatting your um, spreadsheets. 
um, well. So, you know, if, if you read that, if you read that paper, one of the suggestions was to not leave blanks to explicitly code, have some sort of way to code things. So if you had just blanks in your Excel spreadsheet and within a column and you used NA is equal to quote, quote, then yes, the blanks will be encoded as NA. Does that make sense? Okay. Yeah, so um, it, I, again, you know, it, it's not, I, I would just like you to think about kind of good uh, spreadsheet hygiene. So, and again, like, you know, the easier you cut this, earlier you kind of catch these issues, the easier a job you will have of cleaning the data. You have anything else to add, Eric? No, uh, I think that covers it. Yeah, just be careful when reading. I mean, it seems simple, but uh, as, as we see, if you encode things differently, it can change your results. So, yeah. Um, so that was that was kind of the main take home point of the homework. Does anybody have any other questions about assignment two? Okay, so I am going to go back to back to part three. So I'm going to paste this link into chat so we can all be on the same page. So um, the other announcement is that we've posted all of um, all of the class videos so far under class. So you can see that there is a YouTube video. Um, we haven't yet kind of time coded it. We, I, we just honestly haven't had the time, but usually you can, at least it's in a format that you can kind of scrub through and find the part that you're interested in. Um, okay, let's see. So I just want to address some of the muddiest points. Um, I said I did mention this checking your data types. So I got a lot of responses last week that you still don't see the point of here. <laughs> so I'm going to try to do another demonstration and hopefully this will make things a little more understandable. Um, it's if you put every if you have all of your RMDs in the root of your project folder, you technically don't need here, but it's like, you know, like I said, um, a lot of the times I will kind of reorganize my folders and here is just kind of this tool that prevents your code from breaking. And we'll talk about this more in a second with the, with the, with the demo. So um, there are a lot of, there are some questions about ggplot2. Um, once, once, person did say that they were having troubles, troubles with understanding how to read ggplot2 code. So I don't want to single them out. I just want you to know that you can contact Eric or me for a review session and we'll try to clear things up for you. Um, let's see. So there is a there was a question about how to deal with lots of missing data when creating ggplots. So this is something that you you have to be aware of that ggplot does give you a warning when the, there's, a very, there's a variable that you've mapped um, into your plot that has a lot of missing values. And if, the, if there are any, if there are values missing in within that variable, it's going to drop that entire row that contains that missing value. So you're not going to see any points that, um, that belong to that. So, uh, you know, Jessica Minier and I have been talking about when, when is a good, good time to really talk about missing values. And uh, to be honest, I'm not really prepared to talk about except like, you know, the theoretical approaches to missing values. There's a lot of contention here, um, but there, um, we can, I'll, I'll try to set up a little discussion next week and we can we can kind of talk about kind of approaches to missing values. Um, just just to just to be aware that like you know D 
dealing with missing values um, is really kind of not the, it's not the job of ggplot2. It assumes that you're giving it the very best data that you can give it. There are some, you can kind of um, do, you can kind of work around this, but really you should be um, dealing with your missing values um, with the dplyr package. And we'll talk next week about the tidyr package as well. Um, so let's see, and another person mentioned it would be interesting to learn more about G ggplot. So can we do more with facet wrap? So um, for today, I added a short section on more of the ggplot2 fundamentals. So we'll look at be looking at scales and colors. Um, scales are really helpful for when you want to kind of change the the tick marks on your on your data set or format format the axes um, like in terms like of different formats. So for example, if you had an axis that was dollar, um, it will help you like it would add a dollar sign to the beginning of that number. So it's very clear that you know you are using a your that your variable is in dollars. Um, we'll look a little bit at colors as well. Um, I think this is actually kind of a fun section and I don't know why I didn't include it before. Um, okay, so questions questions about dplyr. So still one person said still wrapping their head around how to use how exactly to use select, filter, and arrange, especially in sequence. And another person did say that as well. I think practice will help. So there's there's some things I don't know if this is going to be helpful to you at all, but um, since I work I've worked in Excel a lot, I I tend to find it helpful to kind of find the equivalent operation in Excel. Um, so filter is much like setting up a data filter in Excel. So you know when you can set um, different kind of criteria to fill um, on different columns and you can combine columns. So it's much, it's very much like doing so, doing a data filter. Um, select, so that's very much like selecting columns in Excel. So like, for example, you can, um, you can use, like if you're selecting a range of columns, so like A1 to G1, um, or I think Excel now lets you use name, name references, but that's, that's very much like what select is. And a range is the equivalent of doing a sort on your data. So you want to sort by a particular um, particular variable or combinations of variables. Um, I don't know if that was helpful. Are there any any questions about um, dplyr right now? And again, we do want to make sure that you're you're getting the material. So if it makes you if, if it's more comfortable to kind of request an individual appointment, please let us know. So again, this was this was kind of um, well, it was good. It's good for me. It's less good for you because everyone was mentioning that you know this info would have been so helpful for the stat sequence. <laughs> yes. <laughs> So again, you know, this is kind of a, a matter of sequencing. So, you know, hopefully we'll, you know, the, the department will address this. Okay, so um, now I'm going to move on to part four. So I'll paste this in. So let's see. So we'll, we'll, we're going to open these slides here. So I'm just going to click on this link. Um, and I just want to give you an overview of what we're going to be covering today. So um, I just went to our studio global, which was a big conference. So just want to post these words of comfort from Hadley Wickham. So again, Hadley, Wickham is the chief scientist at our studio. He's the architect of dplyr, ggplot2, um, really smart, smart guy. Um, but 
so you know he even he thinks thinks these things of himself but you know he, he does think you know occasionally he'll beat himself up like i must be a more not if i can't perform the simple maintenance task so part of this is of addressing your frustration is being able to kind of reframe this i didn't and like i was really surprised that he kind of addressed this um, because it is one of the, it, this is called self-soothing and it's one of the foundations of cognitive behavioral therapy. So reframing this first thought as this isn't something I do very often, so it's unreasonable to expect that I'd automatically be expert at it. So this is someone who is very high level, like he's incredibly smart, like, you know, you think he's on top of everything, but even he has these like spells. <laughs> So hopefully that's that's of comfort to some of you. Okay, um, actually, yeah. So we're going to have a demonstration about here as well. Oh, and I, um, I I forgot to mention we're also going to have presentations from Natalie and Jessica, um, and we'll we'll be doing that in a little bit little bit. So just to give you a preview of what's going to what we're going to be talking about during the lab is basically we're talking about this um, we're talking about this function called mutate. And I really like this illustration from Allison in that I, to me it's 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 directly analogous to like calculating making a new column and calculating the value of that column based on other columns. So this is a very um, this is as an Excel like operation that we do a lot. Um, it is this function is surprisingly deep, so we'll be exploring more about that. Um, within mutate, um, this is a really useful function called case one, um, and it lets you basically um, one of the uses is to encode reencode data, um, so you can recode values. But you can also make um, continuous values into discrete values. So, for example, if you had age, like, and your age ranged from zero to seventy, you could cut that up with a case one statement into individual categories. So, like, zero to fifteen, sixteen to thirty, um, and et cetera. And you can do this within a single within a single statement. So we'll we'll get into that in a second. Um, we'll talk a little bit about across. Um, so, like I said, um, I have my own set of tutorials on this. Jessica did a little tutorial on dplyr across, um, and we'll talk about this later. But again, it's like per, doing some sort of transformation or summarization on a selection of columns, um, and then doing doing something with them. And if that's unclear, we'll we'll get into it a little more a little later. Um, sorry, I don't have a cute. Uh, I have don't have, have one of Allison's uh, awesome slides for this, uh, but we'll be talking about group by summarize. So these two commands usually go together, in a dplyr statement, and it will let you basically produce summaries over categories. Finally, um, we're going to end with janitor clean names. And this, this is one thing that doesn't seem that useful when you first see it, but it's a way to kind of standardize the way your columns are named. And especially dealing with issues like, you know, someone included a space um, in the column name. So it has a very kind of prescriptive way of dealing with that. Okay, so let's see. Oh, okay, and then um, uh, we'll talk about uh, if there's more questions about this, we can talk about it um, after after um, the break. But the midterm is going to be assigned next week. So what I want you to do is I want you to look at the Tidy Tuesday data sets and identify one data set that you're interested in and identify a research question that you think could be answered by the data. So this is going to be what you're going to be using for your midterm. And part of the idea of the midterm is really to show, show the skills that you've acquired and to let give you a chance to kind of practice on something that you're interested in. 
So in terms of guidance, your data set should have both categorical variables and continuous variables. Um, we'll take part of next class doing some short meetings to discuss both the midterm and what, it, what, what the expectations are. And um, you can have individual meetings with Eric or me um, to talk about the data. So we'll, we will add some um, breakout rooms and we can, we can bring in people in separately. Um, are there any questions about the midterm? Okay, so I will ask you a question. Does this make you feel, does it, is a midterm exciting or does it make you feel uncomfortable? Okay, we gotta like it. <laughs> but again, so I think, you know, I, I am all about empowering, empowering, you all to like do things with data. So I think if you have, a, if there's a data set that you're interested in, you're more likely to kind of pursue it and learn. So yeah, so just stay stay curious. So I just wanted to show you this, the, the Tidy Tuesday data sets and just kind of take you through the project. So this is what's called a GitHub um, repository page. You don't need to know too much about this, um, but I want you to scroll down here to data sets. So these are the, um, what this project is, is it's a um, Tom, Thomas Mock who works for our studio. He started this when he was a PhD student. And the thought was that it's basically kind of an opportunity to look at new data. And so he, he and the uh, R for Data Science group, they've curated a bunch of different data sets. So you can see that these are the 2021 data sets. Um, and here are the 2020 data sets. If you just scroll down, you'll find more information. Um, there is a really, there's some really fun ones in here. Um, uh, beer production is a very fun one. Um, the office is kind of is interesting. It is uh, mostly text. So try to find um, try to find like, you know, not, not only a data set you're interested in, but think about a question that you're interested in asking of the data. Um, uh, one of our students last last time uh, did a thing on best rap, rap artists. Um, this was a really fun one, Animal Crossing. So there's lots of different data sets. So hopefully you will be able to find something that's of interest to you. And um, I am thinking about making the midterm. So if you wanna team up with someone um, and work on your midterm together, I, I would highly encourage that. Um, I, my one thing, and I will point, point this out in the midterm is that you have to, in your R markdown file, you have to point out to the contributions of each individual. So X worked on this plot, you know, or Y basically did the, the data wrangling. But again, it's like an opportunity for you to kind of stretch yourself and kind of learn stuff. So, you know, as active as, as I try to make the class, I mean, I think this is kind of where the rubber hits the road and you been, begin to actually think of like, oh, that's what this function is for. So that's that's it about the midterm. So let's go over into our studio cloud now. So when you are ready, um, you, you have your uh, prep part four project loaded up, just click um, yes and under the participants tab. Okay, so we're, like I said, we're going to talk a little bit more about here. So I'm going to open up this, this is in the root folder and it's called the here underscore example dot RMD file. Um, okay. So we've got this example is in our root folder. So we know that this is going to work in the root folder. 
so if I knit this, actually, let's put in a smoke complete here as well, just so we can confirm that we loaded it. And now I'm going to knit it. And you can see we loaded in the data set as expected. So what I want you to try to do is under file, I want to, um, or actually let's do it in the file tab. So I'm in the file tab here. I'm going to check, uh, click the checkbox next to here example, and I'm going to move it into another folder. So I'm going to type under the more, um, um, I'm going to go down to move. And I'm going to move it into this markdown folder. Okay, so it's going to give you that, well, it's not in the current location. It's not in the root folder anymore, so it needs to close. So let's open it up in markdown. So I'm going to try to run this again. And you can see that I'm getting an error here. So path does not exist. Data smoke complete dot XLSX. And that is because, again, you know, the the relative path is always from the location of the R markdown document. So this is how we fix it. So instead of this, this code, I'm just going to delete this code here. I'm going to copy in this code here. And let's take a look at this. So um, we loaded in the here library. Um, the rest of the libraries are identical. But for our file argument, we wrap, we wrap our path, our relative path in here. So this means that it's going to look in the project root folder um, and that's where it's going to start all of the relative paths. So I'm going to save this again, and now I'm going to knit it. And why is everything <laughs> OR Studio? So you can see it now. It now worked. Um, well, actually, I didn't show, I didn't exactly show, like, you know, that it loaded the code, but it didn't throw an error. So I'm hoping that makes it a little more understandable why you would want to use here. Again, it's, it has to do with kind of file organization. Um, you know, like, for example, I am working on this, I'm working on this microbiome project and we have probably on the order of about 10 R markdown. Well, across the three data sets, there are probably about 30 R markdown files that we have to keep track of. And so we um, we basically use here so we can put all of our we can put organize like you know all of the all of the data processing um, the data processing R markdowns in one folder. And then we can put in like the the analysis ones in another folder, and then we can put um, the the plotting ones in yet another folder. So um, does that is, is does that help people understand what here is for? Do you know? Um, I actually kind of wonder if I actually ex asked this exact question last class, but do you know if here works with variables like say if you wanted to put that string as a variable name um because that kind of seems like maybe that would be a good reason to use it um so let's let, let me see if i can understand what you're saying so um like if i had are, are you saying like if i had a vector of names yes like, so if um, the string data slash smoke complete was part of a vector of names, mm -hmm. including others. Yeah, so it doesn't solve, it doesn't quite solve the, the problem of loading in multiple data sets. Um, we'll, we'll look at per, and we can basically take a vector of data set names, 
and um, we can apply read Excel to it with particular parameters using one function called uh, map and per. I hope that answers your question. Thank you. Yes, sure. it does. So again, I think, you know, and I have been, you know, every time I, I think I, I do suffer from like the curse of, um, I can't remember what it's called, curse of too much knowledge. <laughs> So it's hard for me to see what other what people aren't seeing. So if you get it and it took you and like the way I understood I taught it to you wasn't very clear, I'd really love to hear your opinion on how you understand it because this is kind of how I make these materials better. So that's our little that's our here demonstration. Um, this is probably going to be the this is probably going to be the hill that I die on um, is like encouraging people to use projects in here. <laughs> but um, again, this is kind of making about making your code, you know, reproducible. And the alternative to doing this is to basically set my working directory to markdown. Um, or use an absolute path here and then do everything from the absolute path. That is really kind of, that's really a pain. Um, I don't, I think there's a GIF out there of Jenny Bryan. So she's an, um, another really smart software engineer at our studio. Um, she says, if I see that, if I see that line in your code, I'm going to burn your house down. So at the very least, think about, you know, think about, you know, Jenny Bryan is going to get angry if you use that WB. Um, and again, this is something that I think, you know, as you kind of continue to kind of build your own projects um, and, you know, run your own scripts and markdown files, you'll find it, you'll eventually get the point of it. Okay. So we have about 15 minutes before the break. So I'm just going to go over the first part of. Um, part four. So now we're going to open up the part four file in our studio cloud. So let's talk about our learning objectives for today. I, we're going to learn and apply the mutate verb to change the data type of a variable. Um, this is kind of the easiest thing you can do. Um, you can apply mutate to calculate a new variable based on other variables in a data frame. I mentioned this. Um, we'll apply the case when um, case when uh, function in a mutate statement to make a continuous vari variable categorical. Um, we're going to learn about uh, group by and summarize. These are two commit two functions that often go together as a pattern to get summary statistics including counts, means, and standard deviations within a category. Um, we will look at across a little bit, but again, I do, um, I think that section might be a little confusing, but we'll, we'll, we'll definitely discuss it. We'll discuss um, clean names uh, as a way to standardize variable names. And this is a se the section that I added um, about scales and colors for ggplots. Okay, so let's um, let's uh, load the load the data set. So I'm on line 24. I'm just going to run this code box. So you can see we loaded our old friend Smoke Complete. So if there was one name of a function, I would shoot. Where did that? Oh, okay. Um, if there's one, if there's one dplyr verb that I would um, change, it would pro the name of it would probably be mutate because I don't think it's a very, and it's not like I think the other verbs are very kind of in, it's it's instinctive what they do, but mutate is not. <laughs> so again, like Allison's illustration, so it lets you add columns to a data set. And so you can basically, this is much in the, like in Excel, like applying a formula to two different columns and producing a new column. 
So, I, and again, um, I do tend to think of this as like using formulas in Excel. Um, so these are kinds of just kind of thinking about the things I, I do in Excel all the time. So subtract one column from another. So you can convert the units of one column to new units. So like in our example, we had days, um, days, um, days to birth, I believe. And, you know, we could convert that to years. Um, we can do things like changing, like whether ca um, categories were capitalized or not. And again, what we can recode a continuous variable to be a categorical one. Yeah, thanks, Eric, for uh, pasting that link to um, to Jenny Bryan's post about here. Okay, so now we are on the line 58. So I'm going to scroll this up a little bit. And the first use of mutate, like I said, we're going to calculate a variable based on other variables. So, for example, we can um, we can do Excel this Excel type calculations. And much like Excel, we can make um, we can put in formulas into the mutate statement. So the way to read this is that we are going to take the agic diagnosis and we're going to add it to days to death, and we're making a new variable called age at death. So let's run this code. And you can see the, that the variable was created as the last variable. So this is age at death. And we added both the, um, sorry, age at diagnosis and um, date, uh, where is it? Days to death here. And then we got a, a single, a single uh, call, a new variable that summarizes both of them. Uh, so what do you notice about the fourth and fifth values of age to death? Yeah, that's what I'm getting at, Sarah. <laughs> Anyone notice? Yeah, so these values are missing. So let's look at the fourth and fifth positions of the, actually, this is way easier if we <laughs> use this. So, okay, so it's going to be the fourth and fifth. So if you see that days to death is missing values in both the fourth and fifth rows. So, but agent diagnosis has all, all has, has those val has values in the fourth and fifth rows. So that is a vital thing to know about um, R and missing values. So it, what it's telling you is that it can't, ca it can't calculate this new value because the values that it's dependent on, one of them is missing. Does that make sense? And R is very strict about this, so. Yeah, Sarah, did you have a question? Sorry, is there like an if or count or summarize if, like an if statement of some kind that we could put if it's not um, null, then we can do this calculation kind of thing? Yes, so um, I talked about na.rm um, and we can, we'll, we'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, usually the way to do it is that you will, Drop the rows that have NA. Um, that's kind of the that's kind of the easiest way to do it, and then you can do the cal you can do the calculation. That's kind of the tidy way verse way to do it. But you can apply things like mean and use that NA.RM equals true um, argument as well. Um, okay, so Brady is having an error um, problem with mutate input age age at death. Um, did, did you, is, does it say days to death? Okay, age at death, non numeric argument to binary operator. So can you look at what the, the data type is for age at diagnosis and days to death? And let me know what they are. Yeah, I'll do that right now. Sure.
So in mine, I have um, age. I have agent diagnosis is numeric, and days to death is also numeric. And it, and this is this is what this is like one of the consequences of um, and it might be you I don't know if you loaded a different um, if you loaded you might have had an earlier version of the notebook but um, just make sure that your smoke complete um, your smoke load your loading statement your read Excel statement looks like this okay that might be the problem because it says that they're both um, categorical yeah. So um, make sure that you have NA is equal to NA here. OK, I'll do that. Thank you. Yeah. So again, this is kind of this is a teachable moment. So this is why you should make sure that the NA argument is set. So and if you if you're still having issues, um, let Eric know and he can, he can help you out. OK, so. Um, are there any questions about this first use of mutate? Okay, so let's just do one one um, one exercise. So I want you to just when you're ready, type in this type. Uh, just put your code into chat. So I want you to create a variable called cigarettes total, and I want you to do that by multiplying cigarettes per day by, and this is important, minus days to birth. Because if you look at days to birth, um, you'll notice that it's negative, And that's just how they decided to encode it. So when you're ready. OK, Jessica looks good. Yep, looks good. Looks good. Looks good. Looks good. Yeah. Okay. So that's the first use of mutate. So um, any any questions about this so far? So let's take um, let's take a five minute break. So let's come back at um, well, let's just make it four oh five. Um, so I will see you then. And if you have any questions for me or Eric, just let me know in chat. Um, so uh, so let's get started again. Okay, just as a quick review, so we just learned about creating a new variable using the mutate statement based on the values of other variables. So like I said, mutate is an extremely flexible function. Um, so we talked about like, you know, we've got our data and you've noticed we've got a lot of things that are coded as characters. Some of these we actually might want to make into factors. So let's, for the first thing, let's look at gender and let's convert gender from character into a factor. So let's read this. So you notice that we're, we are called, um, our is the same as the variable that we are using in our calculation or our transformation. So what this will do is it will rewrite over the value of the gender column. So um, we again we we can take a character vector and we can make it a factor using the factor function. So what we're going to basically be doing is converting this character vector into a factor. So let's. So if we look at gender, you can see now that it has the type FCT. So that means it's now a factor. 
And this took me a long, like, you know, when I was learning how to program, this took, this was a little bit mind bending. So in general, in, um, when we do this in programming, it's called reassignment. So again, we're taking the, val the previous value of our variable and we're transforming it. And then we're re reassigning the new, the transform version of our variable back into gender. So you can think of, we're basically kind of processing this column in place. We're just changing the, the data type. Um, okay. Any questions? Any questions about reassignment? I, I do think that this this is sometimes a little hard. It can be a little mind bendy. <laughs> yeah. So Jessica, that's exactly what we're doing by making it into a factor. We're making it into a categorical variable. Good question. Okay, so we, when we talked about factors, we also knew, noticed, knew that there was a, um, uh, we also noticed that there is a, um, there is a limit, and that lets us control the orders in which the factors are presented. So, what I want, uh, what we can do is basically, again, we we're doing the same thing. We're calling the factor function to make gender a factor or a categorical variable, and we want the order of categories to be this. So we want female and then male. So we can provide this levels argument um, to our to to our our factor. Um, our factor our factor function and i'm going i'm showing you this is a function in the janitor package that works much like table i think we we saw this before but table will basically let us um uh pr produce produce table counts in a tidy way so we can just call the um we can just call the gender column so let's take a look at it so you can see in our table, um, it's it like the 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 categories begin with female and then male. So let's just confirm that that's the case. So let's make, and this is not a this is not a statement on gender um, or anything. I'm just showing you the order and the order is going to change. Um, so you can see now male is first and then female is next. So any any questions about um, factors? And we'll be working more with factors next time. There's a lot of um, there's a lot of commands. Uh, what in this package called four cats, which is short for four categorical variables. Um, the the sticker is funny because it is a, it, it features a cat on it, but that's the short. Um, that's what four cats means. Okay, I I can't rem I, I can't remember who is asking the question. I think it was um, Sarah, but I'm not. I can't remember. But um, so this is one way to deal with missing values. So perhaps we want to um, we we want to recode days to last follow up, and you know perhaps we're just interested in. Um, we we just want we want to recode the NA as something else. So we can use this replace NA function in our mutate statement. And the first argument for replace NA is the variable we want to replace the NAs in. And then the value, the value of um, that we want to replace NA with. And this is something to think about this, this value has to be the same data type as um, as your um, as as your column. Otherwise, like if I put in a string here, like quote zero, this is or a character. This is going to um, basically change the data type to 
of the column to a character. So be be just again, this is another reason to be thinking about um, you know understanding the data types of each of the columns. But I'm going to replace the NAs um, and days the last follow up with zeros. So let's let's run this. So if we look in the days to last follow up, actually let's um, let's look at the table first. So days to last follow up. So we notice that the first two values in date in our smoke complete data set are missing. So let's take a look. Days to last follow up. So you can see that these were now encoded as zeros. Uh, so this is one approach to kind of dealing with NAs, but again, it has to make just like, you know, it has to make sense for what you're summarizing. Um, so that's kind of why R is very strict with NAs. It forces you to come up with an approach to deal with them. Um, and some people don't like this about R, but I think it's actually very useful because it requires you to have on how you're going to deal with the missing values. Any questions about replace NA? Okay, so let's move on. So um, I've alluded to this the whole time. Now we're on the line 131 using mutate to make a continuous variable categorical in case one. And come on, you can vote. So what we can do with case one, and this takes a little understanding of how it's laid out. And this, it's, um, but when you get used to it, it's, um, it's real, you'll realize that it's like a really useful way to kind of uh, recode data. So let's take a look at this. So they um, basically, um, you know, they want to create a new column called danger here. And so they're going to talk about the danger. So when type is equal to Kraken, so this is a this is much like the the filter statements. This is um, condition. This is a, some sort of conditional statement. So we're saying when the type is Kraken, we do that with a double equal sign. The way to read the tilde here is as a then then we code that value in, in danger as extreme uh, exclamation point. So that's, we just, um, we, and if we want to encode everything else as high, we put a value here. So this is equal to, um, basically this produces, um, a true value statement, but oh, I'm getting an internet connection is unusable. So please let me know if you can't hear me. Um, so true just kind of is a way of encoding all of the other values in our data set. So if it's any other value, so if it's dragon, cyclops, or dragon here, then we encode the, them as high. So if you have used R before, if else to do this, but the real strength of case when is that you don't have to nest um, multiple if else statements. So they are evaluated in order and it helps you basically, um, and a lot of the times if I have these if else statements and if else is a command that basically you can say something like this, if type is equal to Kraken, then you know you encode it as this, but if it's not that, then you encode it as that. But to get multiple values, you have to use these. You have to use kind of um, multiple in-depth if-else statements. So this will let you encode multiple values at once. Does that make sense? And, and again, it's, um, I think it will probably make more sense 
Does it work for just two options? Um, it can work for two options, as you can see here, but it will. It can work for um, depending on how much you want to encode the logic. It can work for like ten options. It can work for twelve options. Yeah, so you can add several categories. Um, so yeah, the true. <laughs> okay, so it's. Let me let me let me try and kind of clarify this. What it's really co coming down to, and this is how filter works as well. So I'm just going to add a code block here and just show. So say I have I'm just going to call this animals. So I have a vec I have a character vector here. So what's happening is so if I say animals equals dog, it doesn't give you what you expect. So what do you notice about the the position of the true value in this in this statement. So this is a Boolean, it's called a Boolean vector. Yeah, it's the position of dog. So um, I what what is really under going up underneath the underneath is that like so here I say type is equal to Kraken. What this is returning is it's a vector. It's a vector of trues and falses, and the true position, the positions of the trues are where it's equal to Kraken. So there's, so we'll go through this and kind of do that. A way to make sure that something is always, um, and again, this goes in order, but again, a way to do this in. Um, Sorry, in a way to this, tr it's basically true is kind of the cover all everything else. So if something is, it's always like because we're going down kind of the list, it means encode all of the others as high. And it's it's a very, um, it's, this is kind of a very slippery concept and we can talk more about this if people want to, but that's, that's kind of where the true comes from. It's a very kind of uh, it's a very kind of uh, it's a very kind of computer science. Thing. So if I do this, and we didn't we haven't really talked about indexing. So we know that dogs is going to be a boolean vector. If animals in dogs it's going to get it's going to get the value at the third position because that is true it's not going to return the values at the other positions because those are false um, and that's that's kind of what is going on under the hood like when so filter statements work exactly like this. Um, so what you're doing is you are, it's returning the row, it, what it's doing to R is it's returning a, a Boolean vector. And when you apply that to the data frame, that only returns those values for which the, the values are true. <laughs> I, I hope I didn't um, confuse everyone completely. Yeah, and Sarah, so we are going to get into a uh, more complex example, like Natalie is asking in a second. So again, so there is a basic pattern for the case when statement. So there is a condition on one side, and then there's a tilde, and then there is the name of the category. So left side is always going to be condition. And there's going to be a tilde, and then the right to the right of the tilde is going to be the name of our category. 
So let's go through an example. So first of all, um, let's let's concentrate on the first first mutate statement. So we are going to create a new variable. What is the new variable going to be called? Anyone? Yeah, cigarettes category, exactly. We're going to use the case one function. And so this is our first, this is our first, um, sorry, uh, this is our first, uh, this is our first condition. So when cigarettes is less than or equal to five, we're going to encode that category as this character, so zero dash five. So this is often how you would encode a, a range. And then if the cigarettes per day per day is greater than five, you can use six. And we'll see an example of true in a second. And I, I think what before I didn't use true right away. So hopefully this will be a little clearer. So this covers everything. So everything that is a less than or equal to five or greater than or equal to five. So we're only going to have two character values. So if we run this part, actually let's pipe it into view. Just clear. Oh, okay, sorry, that's in the wrong place. Um, so delete this, if you put that there. It has to go here. So instead of on line 177, it should be on line 178. So I'm just going to run the, these first few lines. Uh, just give me a second. I'm just going to try running this part. Okay, so re remember we're looking for cigarettes, cigarettes per day here. And then we're going to look for our new category. So we've got cigarettes categories. And if you go through all of these different values, you can see that they are coded in zero to five. But notice that it's a character vector. So if we want to kind of complete the scheme of things, we want to actually make this into a fact. We want to make cigarettes category into a factor. So what we want to do, so again, we'll call cat factor on cigarettes category. And we're going to provide the levels. And this is very important when you've got um, nominal categorical data. So nominal or, or sorry, nominal nor ordinal categorical data. So the categories have some sort of inherent order. This is kind of what you would use the levels for. And so zero to five should go before six plus um, in our cases. So. Let's, um, and hopefully that you put back the pipe statement here on line 178. So what we're going to do is we're going to cast that as a factor, then we're going to do the cigarettes category. So which category should go come first in our table? Should it be zero to five or six plus? Yeah, exactly. So let's see if that's the case. So, and as expected, because we encoded the levels, you can see that zero to five um, is now first. Um, so this is a good insurance policy um, because you can set the your expected order and it's going to display in that order. So, okay. This one is a little difficult. 
So let's let's kind of get let's kind of talk about this a little more. So instead of putting the the other category, so greater than five here, I could have put in true. And it would give me the same same result. And again, that's because these um, these recodings go in order. So we take all of the ones where cigarettes per day is less than or equal to five, and then we recode those. Then we can put a true here, and that will cover all of the other values. This can be a this could be a problem if we had NA data in here. So um, sometimes sometimes actually having explicitly um, covering everything. So the cigarettes per day is equal to five, greater than to five is as six plus. This is probably the safer way to encode this. So let's let's tackle um, this one, uh, this, this exercise on 190. So I'm gonna give you some hints. Here. So what I want you to do is modify this code to, to recode categories to have three levels. So you're going to have a cigarettes per day. Another another if that um, conditional here. And then you're going to encode that as 11 plus. And remember that um, for the middle category, for the middle category, I think technically this is going to work. Yeah, no, I think you to be safe, you should have two conditions here. So it should be cigarettes per day greater than five. And then you should use uh, and, remember we learned that with filtering, to chain another conditional. So Colin's question, so the line with true is ignoring the rose handled. Yes, exactly. So be, that's the thing to know with case when is that it processes them in order of the conditions that you set. Um, I'm glad you, you like this, Bradley, because this is, I, I, um, this is actually the number one most voted function that I should, I should teach. And I'm glad to note that I, because this is one, one that everyone uses. And I made sure to cover this last time, but it was also good to get confirmation that people find this useful. Okay, so um, if you need some help, if you need some help with, always ask us in chat. Um, but if you if you come up with an answer, um, post it in, uh, just post it in chat. So Amanda, that looks that looks really good. Anyone, anyone else? Yeah. So you need to add another cigarettes per per day in here. Sorry, that wasn't clear. Okay. So let's look at Bradley's code. Looks good, Bradley. So let's take a lot of people to kind of work through the exercise. Okay, it looks like people people are people are getting this exercise. Um, are there any questions about this? So I'm going to go over it. So we want 
for the middle category, we want cigarettes per day. So we probably want to encode this as six to 10 for one. And then we want to chain the two conditions. So cigarettes per day greater than five and then cigarettes per day less than or equal to 10. And then don't forget the, the comma here. And then the last one, cigarettes per day greater than 10, I think, yeah. And then that's going to be coded as 11 plus. So we need to change these levels. So this becomes six to 10. And then 11 plus. So if we do the table, you can see now we have um, yeah, so Sarah, this is, it's so, not everyone teaches this command, but I think it's so useful. Um, so it, again, we are still within mutate, but um, I have found that this to be so useful and everyone kind of comes in with the question, how do you recode numeric variables into categories? So um, it, it becomes really useful. I mean, I'll tell you about, um, like the, one of the projects I'm working on, you know, there's a patient cohort and we need to, to, to find the disease cohort within this larger patient cohort. So we needed to identify the disease candidates. Um, and then um, we needed to defi defi uh, grab the healthy, the healthy control candidates as well. And so we ha actually had to use multiple, we had a bunch of Boolean variables in our metadata and we would, we we're basically setting things like um, ankylosing spondylitis. So if that value is true, then we would recode it as AS. And then um, I think it, it's a disease equals HC, so we would, oh, and that needs to be a double. So, and then everything else, because we haven't um, encoded it, we would we basically put, put true equal to NA because they were not relevant to our study. Um, but that's, that's a real life example. I use this all the time. And um, I just, I think once you kind of get used to it, you'll realize that it's one of the most powerful tools in the tidyverse and dplyr. So again, I mean, this is part of this is really, you know, we like really asked ourselves, what are the things that we use every day that are the most useful? So we have tried to really kind of cut the fat with this course. Um, and really try to teach you as much as many useful things as possible as quickly as we can. Okay, so we have talked about mutate. And again, mutate is for calculating uh, is for you know calculating new values of a column or recap um, re reassigning the value of a column. Um, so let's look at summarize. So I think it's important to talk about summarize before we talk about group by summarize because it's more it makes more sense about what's going on. So this is a command in which you can produce summaries across a particular um, variable. So if I wanted to just find the average cigarettes per day across all of the data in smoke complete, you, I could do this. So smoke complete. And then we're using the summarize. And summarize has a lot, it has a syntax much like um, much like uh, much like mutate, in that we're assign making a new column, and the mean is going to be, and we're going to take calculate the mean of the cigarettes per day. The difference between summarize and mutate is it's only going to return this column. So if we run this you'll see that we have a column, it's just a one row data frame, and it just has the average number of cigarettes smoked across all of the, 
all of the cohort. So cigarettes per day is a good variable because we don't have missing values. But if you have missing values, remember we talked about na.rm. So you can like, so if we run smoke complete on years smoked to produce an average year smoked, you'll see we get an na here. But if we use the na.rm uh, argument and we set it to true, we can actually calculate it on all of the ones uh, which for which we don't have for which the values are not missing. So you can see now we have a number instead of NA. So what are the kinds of things that summarize is useful for? Um, so nearly any summary statistic you can think of. Um, so mean, um, median, so central tendency, spread, so you can do standard deviation, um, Ranges, min, max. Um, ranges is, is a kind of different because it returns two values. Running range, you have to run min and max separately and encode them as different um, variables. Position. So, what is the first? Um, the the first uh, in like a in a category is the last uh, in a variable. What is the the nth place, so what is the third row? Um, you can do that. And then there's these counting functions. So these are really useful. So just this n function, um, you can use it to count categories. So you can, um, or uh, count the number of rows. So we this is summarized by itself. It's OK. Um, but it's really when you combine it with group by that it becomes really, really powerful. So in general, group by is usually almost always followed by summarize. And group by, and who you summarize first, is that group by seems a little abstract. So if you run group by on something, it's just going to look like it returned the data frame. But what it's doing is it's splitting our data frame into a, no, into a number of smaller data frames that are split out by a particular category. When we do that, now we can actually use summarize to do the summary calculation on the smaller data frames. And so we can get a per category summary. So let's look at an example. So if we want to calculate the mean cigarettes per day smoked between males and females, we would do the following. So again, we take smoke complete, we pipe it into our group by statement, and this is where we put the, the, the category that we're interested in. So we're interested in gender. We want to summarize across gender. or, And then we're going to calculate the mean cigarettes smoked per day. So you can see now um, we have um, we have mean cigarettes and we've calculated the mean number of cigarettes smoked within each of these categories. And for some reason, males tend to smoke slightly of, on the average of one more cigarette than females. So any questions about this? The incredibly powerful thing is that you can put multiple multiple categorical variables in here. So let's look for another one. Um, so let's put in state. I say state is whether they're alive or dead. Oh, and okay, this so this evidently the ah that's interesting. So. I guess there's only live people in this data set. Oh, so let's look at vital status. Okay, so you can see we have all combinations of both gender, gender and vital status. 
Um, you can see the males that are dead smoked slightly more cigarettes than those who are alive. Um, those who are female also smoked slightly more cigarettes than those who are alive. So you can see that like, you know, this becomes extremely powerful when you need to produce summaries over something like a patient population. Um, and if, there, if there's time next time, I'll, I will show you this tool that I've used called GT Summary, um, which is incredibly useful for producing statistics on what we call table one, um, table one in papers. So it's usually the, the part in a paper that tells you about the patient cohort. Okay, so that is just one, we, we just calculated mean. But we can also, in our summarized statement, we can put multiple values in our summarized statement as well. And we can also do this in our mutate statement. Um, so if we wanted to define multiple columns um, at the same time, we just have to separate them by a comma. And so you can see that we are defining a variable here called mean, and that's going to produce a mean cigarettes per day. And then we're going to get a measure of spread by calculating the standard deviation. So um, how many columns should this, would this output? Anyone have a guess? Yeah, three, that, that's, that sounds right. So there should be gender, mean, and standard deviation. So let's run it. And as expected, we have three columns. So um, any questions about group by or summarize? Okay, so let's talk about, um, let's talk about um, counting things. So like I mentioned, there is this n function and you can basically, so if we wanted to get a count of the number of subjects in our data set with each type of disease, we could do this. So it's going to group by disease and it's going to count the number of patients within each category. And you can see, so now that like, you know, when you're writing a paper and someone's like, how many patients do we have in this, uh, with this disease in a cohort? Like you can immediately answer them. And this is where like you can look very impressive in front of people and you can just type in the R code. And um, sometimes that's, that's a good thing and sometimes it creates unrealistic <laughs> expectations, but um, it is really good when I'm working, when I'm working with collaborators and they need to know things really quickly, I can pull, pull these out of the data set. Is there a way to get full summary statistics when you use group by? Um, I, my guess would be to use summary, but I don't know how that works. So let's try it. So smoke complete. So group by disease. I think it's gonna tell me that this, this doesn't work, but give it a shot. Summarize. I don't think this is going to work. Yeah, because summary outputs a table and this is expecting a vector. <laughs> so this is not the way to do it. Um, people have actually written what are called convenience functions. So if you needed to um, produce uh, summaries for a number of different categories, you can do this. And we'll see this in across. Um, but that's why people have kind of built functions on top of these functions because you know there's like um, there there are kind of kind of can summaries that you use all of the time. So this is kind of build your own, but someone might have built it built a package on top of the tidyverse that does what you want it to do. Um, so let's get rid of that because that wasn't helpful. 
Okay, so let's try this exercise. So what I want you to do is use group by summarize to calculate the maximum cigarettes per day within each disease category. And then when you're done, just place, post your code, code into chat. Hey, Sarah, looks good. Sorry, sometimes it's hard to monitor chat. Yeah, so Jessica, think, think about um, whether you wanna use N or something else there. Okay, Sarah looks good. Martin looks good. Sam looks good. Hey, yeah, looks good, everyone. Uh, I'm just going to. Uh, this is this is kind of um, just a little bit of. I just want to show you that there are these packages that are kind of built upon the on, on top of the tidyverse. So I am just installing this package called GT Summary. Um, they didn't break my arm. Okay, well, I guess I can't. Okay, I was hope, kind of hoping that this was just going to happen in the background, but it appears, okay. Uh, well, I will, I will figure out how to fix this and I will show you next time. But this is a really, really neat package. Um, and this is the kind of thing, the thoughtfulness of a lot of our developers is they really think about how people, what the tasks people need to do um, to actually run things. Okay, so let's take a break again. Um, so let's come back in five minutes. So come back at 4.55. Yeah, and thanks for answering that, Eric. Um, so yes, skim is a good way to get full summary statistics. And if you have any questions, just put them in chat and I will I'll be right back. Start resuming recording. Okay, so I've made an executive decision. So a cross is very useful, but I think what I'm going to be, I'm, we're going to move down to the ggplot stuff because there's some extra things that I think are really useful to know. Um, and if we have time, we can come back to a cross. Um, and again, like, you know, I do have the tidyl package um, and that is installed in your, um, uh, that is in your, um, it's installed in your RStudio cloud and you can type in the following. Um, um, so there's a whole tutorial based on that. So if we don't get to this, you can, you can run that tutorial. So I am going to go all the way down here. Um, so let's look at clean names before we um, get into the GU plots because this is yet another function that I find is very useful. Um, you can load any time or studio. Come on, you can do it. Okay. 
Well, let's talk about the motivation behind the janitor package. How many times have you dealt with, um, and this is really difficult because you, somebody, someone might give you a, a spreadsheet and someone might be really methodical about it. They call their variable like that. Someone else has a different way of doing it. So, but these refer to the same, these are, these are actually the same me measurable concept. So these variables should technically have the same name. So there is a pack, this is the motivation for the clean names function. It does, it takes a bunch of uh, names that are formatted in particular ways and it standardizes the formatting. Um, in general, it and the the default is what's called snake case. So snake, um, remember, is everything is lowercase, um, lowercase, nothing is capitalized, um, and then the spaces are represented by underscores. So, and again, like if you have ever had collaborators and someone just goes their own way and they decide to name things their own way. Um, this is some this is a function that can help help you quite a bit so we're going to load in this data set um i think aaron was the one who came up with this and these, these are these are real life cases so um he's encountered all of these so um we're going to load this data set called smoke bad call names and so we're using the read.csv function and you can see we're loading in the smoke underscore bad underscore call names dot CSV function. Oh, sorry. This should be, um, you need to type in library reader, I believe, or read Excels. Oh, no, reader. So, so yeah. I mean, you can see there's all sort. These are all sorts of messes. So this is this this column. You know, there the cat the variable is in lowercase, but there's a space in it. There's tumor tumor stage. This is capitalized. Who knows what's going on with vital status? So the person just was shouting, I guess, vital status. Um, so it it's really a pain. <laughs> so you can. Uh, clean names actually tries to do its best to kind of standardize this. So if there's a space, um, it will give you an underscore, um, and it will uh, it will make the capitals lowercase. And especially in the case of this status, it's smart enough to know that that should be a word, a separate word, and lowercase. So if we run our smoke bad call names data set into clean names. Oh, okay. So I'm sorry. I had to reload some things. I'll be right back. My R crashed, so that's why. Okay, so we're back here. So we're going to run. Um, clean names on this. So let's look at let's look at the names. So you can see it it definitely does its best to kind of standardize things, and it's actually a pretty smart function. Um, it will de it will like make everything lowercase. It will transform spaces into into um, under underscores. And it's even smart enough to note that but status was a different word from vital and it added a space there. So um, it's, yeah, so like when someone gives me a data set, this is the very first thing I do when I load, load in the data. I pipe it into clean names so I have a data set so I don't have to remember the capitalization, like every, and to me, it's a much cleaner way to kind of refer to your variables. Any questions about clean names? <laughs> oh. 
Okay. Uh, and there is just uh, one other thing. So there is a there is a function called rename in dplyr. So if you want to rename columns, um, you can explicitly do this with the rename function. So like here we're re renaming age at the agent diagnosis column age. So if we do that, you'll see that agent diagnosis um, is now renamed to age. Okay, so let's get back into ggplot. So um, one thing, this is one thing I didn't really emphasize, but this is what makes ggplot really powerful, is that you're not limited to a single geom in a plot. You can actually layer them on top of each other. So this is a different, um, so we're going to start with a box plot. And this is um, basically cigarettes per day um, on the y-axis and um, disease on our x-axis and the fill is going to be dis um, disease. So we're going to apply a box plot. We're also, we're going to just add a new layer used with a new geom called geom violin. And um, who here has heard of violin plots? Yeah, a couple. Yeah. So some people like them, some people don't. But um, so here we're going to, to make it understandable what we're, what we're doing is we're going to provide an alpha value. Oh, and this, I, I should I should probably talk about this again. Um, this is so uh, remember that when you provide something that is not uh, a value like this, that is not wrapped in an AES statement in a geom, that means this this value applies to all of the row all of the rows in the geom or the whole geom itself. So we're going to make alpha as a way of specifying transparency. So we will, we want the violin plot to be transparent and we don't want it to cover the entire width of the box plot, just so we can kind of see, give an idea of the distribution. So you can see here, we've got, we started with our, our um, box plot and then on top of that, because an order is important here, we uh, put in a transparent, a somewhat transparent violin plot on top of it. So some people actually like po posting, um, doing both of these because the box plot and violin plots kind of answer different questions about distributions. So, and Adding different, and this is the, the thing about this is you do have to be aware that the geoms have to be able to kind of map to each other. So in this case, both box plot and violin work with categorical data and continuous data. So you do have to have some awareness about that. Any questions about layering geoms? Okay, so let's talk about scales. So there is a package called scales in the tidyverse and we we can add them using these scales functions. So what 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 do we use them for? So we can use them to transform numerical axes so we can change an x axis to a log scale for example. This is probably the most useful is changing explicitly changing the breaks or the tick values in the plot. And we'll look at that in a second. Um, you can format values in a scale that's appropriate. So like for example, dollars will always have a dollar sign. Sorry, that should be, I also have a dollar sign in front of it. Um, or time, for example, you could, if you just wanted to have the, the, the decade, so 91, 92, 93. 
So you can kind of format things. The last use is to map discrete and continuous values to particular colors. So like if you wanted to make the Lusk um, category blue, for example, you can explicitly make that. So all scale functions begin with scale underscore, and they're followed by the aesthetic it works, it works on, and then the transformation of the data. This is not always the case. They've actually, this, there's actually a few scale functions that don't, but um, let's, let's look at an example. So this one, scale x continuous. So it works on the x axis and it works for continuous variables. Are there cheats about what plots to use with what data type? Yeah, um, so there are, there are some really good um, kind of decision trees that you can kind of go through. And I, I, I don't remember one right offhand. Eric, if you know any, um, can you post them in chat? But yeah, so you can say like, I've got a continuous, two continuous variables, what can I, what kind of plot can I make with it? So it's not directly mapped into the geoms, but you can usually kind of figure it out. So like scatter plot. Oh, thanks, Brady. Thanks for posting, thanks for adding that. I think that was the one I was going to suggest, I, but um, I'm, glad, I'm glad someone else suggested it. Okay, so let's, now we're on line 504. So um, one of, like I said, one of the main uses for scale functions is to modify the breaks or the tick values. So this is, we're just making, we're making a scatter plot again. So again, we're taking, we're specifying our data set here, our aesthetic mapping. And then we're de de defining our geometry. And we're going to make our point slightly transparent. So this, these are just our labels. So you can see we added this function scale x continuous and we're providing this argument breaks. So this is, these are going to be our tick values in the, in the graph. So if we look here, you can see now we have 10,000, 2,000, 3,000. Um, so this is an extremely power, this is an extremely helpful one. So if I wanted 15,000, You can run it again. And you can see now we have our breaks, our tick values at those particular values. Okay. So as an exercise, how would you modify the y-axis to have the following breaks? So two, four, six, eight, and 10. Um, and one hint is not, you don't use scale X continuous, you use scale Y continuous. So try it out and paste your code into chat when you're done. Casey got it. Oh, sorry, I this misspelled continuous. Thanks for pointing that out. Everyone else get the same as Casey? Yeah, Sarah, Sarah got it. Okay, so let's type, put in the breaks.
Oh yeah, and that's because there is one right up here that's 40. <laughs> The majority of the values are around 10 to 12, but again, there's just one person who smokes 40 cigarettes per day. Um, so the other use for scale functions is to improve the formatting on the axis tick labels. So I am going to fudge this and I'm going to say, instead of this is age, these are dollars. So you can, do, you can provide um, a labels function and there are these built-in functions to scales that start with label. Um, let me just show you. So there's a lot. So if you wanted to have commas um, in yours, you could put use label comma. You can use label date and, and math. And then, so these are all different ways to kind of um, change the labeling of your graph. So label percent, for example. So let's try label, label dollar. Oh yeah, and so you can see now, oh, okay, I did it with, for the y-axis. So you can see now that it's formatted as dollars. So let's, we can add, make, uh, make add commas to our, X axis to so scale X continuous labels equals scales label comma. Oh, Sarah, good question. I'll talk about that in a second. So you can see now we added commas to our variable. Um, and I realize I might have inadvertently used this this notation. Um, this double this double colon notation. So the way to read this is that I'm referring to the scales package, and I want the I want the function label dollar in the package. So this is really useful. Um, so there are a ton of packages that actually have the filter command defined for them. So to let R know that you want to use the, the, the filter command from dplyr, you can specify dplyr colon colon filter. Does that answer your question? And this is something, you may see me doing this, and I do this in our slides just so you know which package a particular function belongs to. You don't, if you have loaded the library and you don't have these um, different function names, you don't have to use these. But this is just to emphasize that this come, these label dollar functions come from the scales package. Um, and they're technically called namespaces, and I'm not really going to get into that because it's a very computer science concept. It's something that you tend to not need to know about until you kind of do more kind of intermediate programming concepts. Okay, so we looked at labels. So let's actually look at mapping discrete colors to categories. And so you can use the scale color manual and you can provide the, the values argument with what this is called a named, this is called a named vector. And I realize I didn't go over this, but the way to read this, so I'm just going to type this in. So the first values are known as the names. I'm gonna assign this into, colors. And if I look at ugly colors, you'll see that on top of the, so at the bottom, these are the actual values of the vector. At the top, these are known as the names for the particular values. So I can actually say ugly colors, uh, ugly col colors, ugly colors, BLCA. 
and I can get that particular value. You can see it's orange. But the way to read this is that you're mapping, you're mapping your category to a color. So for the Lusk category, um, I'm going to map it to lime green. And then for BLCA, I'm going to map to orange and et cetera. So if we run this, you'll see that this is kind of a, a nausea inducing color set, but I was just trying to pick out um, different colors. Um, so with R, there is this whole set of um, color names. If you are familiar with web design, you can also provide what's a hex code. Um, let me find. I'll, I'll post this. So this is kind of a nice little palette. So there are a lot more colors in this, but these are kind of some commonly used ones. So you can see the name. So you would just provide the name as a character in, in, in your um, values vector. So this is kind of a cute book. It's called Yar, the Pirate's Guide. I'll just po post this one too. Um, into chat. So sometimes you just want something to look good. And I'll, say, I'll just say that, you know, I'm not a very, as you can see by my selection of colors, I'm not particularly talented at selecting colors. <laughs> so um, there are packages that like have these color palettes. And this one I'm just going to show you is called Wes Anderson. And so you can call it by using library Wes Anderson. And then we can get the names of all of the different palettes using this command. Oops, I didn't install it, sorry. So let's install Wes Anderson. Install. So I'll post this into chat. Yeah, I should have pre-installed this, I apologize. Okay, so Hopefully this should work. So I'm going to just load the Wes Anderson library in. And so these are all color palettes derived from Wes Anderson movies. Um, and I believe Karthik, Karthik um, Ram, so he's part of our open size. So he developed all these color palettes. So these are all of the names. So if you actually wanna see what the palettes are, you can do this. So it's the Wes underscore palette. And this is Isle of Dogs 1. And so by default, you can see it has six categories or six colors. So you can color six categories with this one. So we can use West Palette as an argument to our scale color manual um, for the values argument. And you can see now we have a much um, well, it looks it looks better than what than anything I could come up with, <laughs> at least the previous example. So one thing to note is that if you tried this with box plot, it's not it's with scale color manual, it's not going to work. You have to use scale fill manual. And you can see now that we have colored our box plot accordingly. So what I want you to do is I want you to pick one of the palettes from Wes Anderson and use it to modify our plot and post your code into chat. Oh, 
with Darjeeling, Darjeeling, Moonrise 3. I'm curious. Ooh, that's, well, not sure about this, <laughs> this goldish color, but I do like the, the pastels, the other ones. But yeah, so this is, this is just one example of palettes. Um, so the question that I'm, I know I'm going to get is what about mapping continuous variables to color? We saw that these are discrete, these are categorical variables. So there is a different, there's a different um, scale that you can apply. And remember, so we're applying our scale to the color aesthetic and we're using gradient to, to specify it. So here we're specifying, we're going to specify year of birth by color and year of birth is a numeric variable. So we can apply scale color variant uh, gradient and we're going to make low, low values black and high values blue. Let's make it light blue. Uh, it probably is going to look ugly, but we can try it. And so you can see like the lower values are coded as black and then the higher, higher values are coded as light blue. So this is one way, um, one way to um, map, this is how you map um, continuous variables to something like color. Um, you can also map to size. We could do another variable, more complete size. Probably not that useful. Well, can also scale them by your birth. Let's just, let's just do this. So theoretically, you could map up to four variables onto your scatter plot. Um, it can be, it, it depends on how the data looks. Um, this can be a good thing or a bad thing, but you can see that um, like our, like 1980, the, when the year of birth is large, the, the, the value, the dot size is large, and when it's small, the dot size is small. Um, just to kind of, um, so I want to talk about Viridis Light. Um, so this is a really important package um, it com because it contains a number of colorblind friendly palettes, um, and they're made to be like, a, the high contrast is high, um, across different kinds of color blindness, I believe. Uh, the one thing about Viridis is that for some reason they decided to go their own way. So all of the Viridis, um, they taught, they have the the aesthetic you're mapping, and then they end with they follow that with Viridis, and then they have this they follow it with D or C. So D is for discrete values, and C is for continuous values. So we can we can basically take our plot and we can add scale color Viridis D. And it's selected these different colors for maximum contrast across the, the three categories. Um, let me remove this. Um, so more so there's more palettes. Um, so Emil the um, he uh, he basically he, he came um, he aggregated a lot of the other palette packages into this package called Palleteer, um, and there's information on you applying those different palettes to ggplot functions there. If you're curious, um, so is there anything else about ggplots you want me to address? Um, obviously, I can't come up with it now, but um, if there's anything else I'll address in a future session.
Well, think about it and let me know in um, let me know in the survey. And again, we'll post the link out to the correct survey this time. Okay, so let's jump back into into a cross. So I'm going to go back up here. And the reason why, uh, again, the reason why I didn't um, kind of continue with this, that this is a, I would say it's a little more advanced topic, um, but we, we have the material here, so we might as well talk about it. But Ted, you have a question about the- Oh, yeah, so, fu yeah. so function of the week. Actually, yeah, so that's a good question, Jessica. Um, so why don't we do that right after the break, if that's okay? Sorry, I it completely slipped my mind. Thank you for reminding me. Okay, so let's talk about a cross. So a cross gives you the ability to create summaries across and you, we saw that you know we could only summarize usually across one column at a time. So we would create one, like the mean of one column. So a cross will let us basically pro, uh, um, use the same, provide the same, uh, do the same summary across a number of columns. So it uses what's called tidy select. Um, so let's look at this example. So she's taking the data frame, she's grouping it by species. And what she's doing is she's doing a summarize, but you can see within the summarize, she uses this function called a cross. And a cross uses two arguments. And the first is the type of, uh, the type of column you want to apply it to, or even the column name the column names, and then the function you want to apply to. And this is confusing because notice that we didn't assign, assign it to any particular column name. So let's, let's look at an example that Jessica sent up. So here's an example where, you know, what she's doing is you can see that she's calculating the mean across a number of columns. So mean days to birth, mean or mean days to death, mean days to birth, mean days to last follow-up. And then, um, so she has to calculate a mean for each of these functions. So what she's doing, and again, so she's putting the across function, I would format this just slightly differently, just so it's clear what's going on. So within the summarize function, she's putting this across function in. The first argument are the columns that you want to select. And here you can see that she's just providing the column names that she wants to summarize. And then she's applying mean. And I think we saw, and so one way to provide extra arguments beyond just the first argument is to follow the function, follow it, the argument after the function name. That's not really that clear, but we're applying, we're going to give na.rm uh, as an argument to mean for all three of these variables. So you can see now we calculated the uh, mean days to death, mean days to birth, and mean days to last follow-up. So, the, the cross function, it, again, it has two main arguments. The main first argument are which columns you want to apply to. Um, Sarah, I don't think you can. I think you actually have, uh, so Sarah's asking, can you have two operations in the cross function? I think you have to have separate across functions for, for that, I, but I'm, I'm not sure right offhand. 
but maybe Jessica kind of goes through this. So this is not the only way that you can pick up, you can select a set of columns in your data set. So, um, and again, this is in this is in the learning tidy select, and I'll have Eric send out a link to that. Um, but there are these functions that are called um, tidy uh, tidy select helpers. And so, you, the way to read this, this is a function that is going to return all of the column names that start with days. So you can see days to death, days to birth, days to last follow up. And then we're going to apply mean and then again provide the na.rm argument. So you can see it gives equivalent. I will say that this is probably the most useful way to use across is like there are all of these functions called is numeric. You can all there's also like is.factor. So you can check whether a column is numeric, for example, and apply the mean function to it. So we can do that. And you can see we pull all of the columns that are numeric out. So there's eight numeric columns and we get a summary for each of those. Um, so, Okay, so this is, I try to avoid teaching this because I find this really confusing. <laughs> um, yeah, let's not do this exercise. I'll have, I'll have a, an exercise um, for you next time. So I will, I will, Sarah, I will take a look. Um, and okay, so Natalie, Natalie and um, Natalie and Jessica, uh, do you want to present right now? Actually, since I think we're pretty much done for the day. Okay, so Jessica, why don't you go first? Um, you should be able to now share your screen. All right, can everyone see my screen? Yep. Okay, awesome. So I had uh, the function fill and this is part of the tidyverse package. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm gonna show you why it's useful and how it works. So first off, we have to start, we have to start off by loading um, the tidyverse package and which I've done here in the library. And then um, what this addresses is missing values. And what the fill function does is um, it takes a previous entry and uses that to fill missing values. So you can kind of think of it as synonymous to like the ditto mark and actually putting in values for like that quotation ditto mark instead of just putting the quotations. Um, and why you would need this function is it fixes um, redundant info. So sometimes in Excel, people won't put in all their data, they'll just leave it empty. But when you um, import that data into R, you can't leave those cells empty. And so you need something, you need to do something to fix that so that you can work with the data in R. Um, so the way you set this up is um, your data will be your data frame. And the command is fill, and then you'll have your parentheses and within those parentheses, you'll have your column of interest. And uh, you can also dictate the direction you want the data to be filled. So the default for fill is to go up, down, or sorry, down, so from top to bottom. But you can also ask it to go up or down, up, and then up and then down. Um, so I'm going to work, or I'm going to show you an example. So I know it was recommended that we use the Penguin's data set. Um, but if we look at the data itself with the summary function, we see that the Penguin data set doesn't have a lot of um, missing values. So um, I'm actually going to use a different data set to show you how this function works. 
Uh, and so this is just data that I found um, on like the GitHub site about how function works. Um, and just a side note, the tibble tribble um, function is just a way of tidying a data frame and it makes data easier to view. Um, so you'll see that here, but don't freak out. Um, so the data here is sales data, and we have um, a column of four quarters, a column for years, and a column for sales. And you'll see here under the year that we have um, missing data for um, quarter two and through quarter four. So the way we can fill that is we take our data set, and then we um, use the and then function, and then we'll put the fill function and in the parentheses we'll put a uh, year because that's what we want to fill. And so we'll see that after we've done that, the year um, has been filled in automatically and it has the appropriate year corresponding with the quarter. Um, and you can also use this with categorical variables. So for this example, we have a data set about pets, um, have a column about rank and then pet type and then breed. And when you're thinking about the direction you want to fill, you want to base it off of the data. So for example, in this data set, you see that the breed um, retrievers and um, bulldogs would be their types of dogs, whereas um, exotic and Siamese are types of cats. So you want to fill from the bottom up. So what you do then is you take that data set and then you do the and then function and then fill and then you'll type in that column of interest, which is pet type. And then you'll specify the direction using dot direction. And in this case, we're going up. And then we see here that um, the appropriate pets are filled in. So is this function useful? I think so. Um, I think we've talked a lot in class about how important it is to address missing data and to clean up data before analysis. So this function makes it really easy and fast to fill in data when you know what needs to be put in. And it's a way of making sure you don't just delete missing data, which would be really problematic. And then I have my references. So that's my function. Great, thank you, Jessica. Does anyone have any questions for Jessica? Awesome. Okay, um, so why don't you stop sharing and Natalie, why don't you go next? All right, just a second here. Let me see if I can get it to share. I can see it. Okay, great. All right. Um, okay, so the one that the function that I decided to do was count. Um, which is another function in the tidyverse. Um, and I just used the R help to understand it better. Um, so count allows us to essentially see um, the number of different arguments in like within a variable um, and then how many of each one of those there are. So it's very related to what we were talking about today. Um, and it is a quick way to better understand um, your data. And it's used with the pipe like many of the other tidyverse functions. Um, I use the example data set empty cars. I didn't um, <laughs> realize that like the penguins one was the one we were supposed to use. So I just oh, you don't, I, no, I just <laughs> provide that as an example. So it's fine to use Oh, okay, great. Data. Yeah, I've just used this data set in the past, for example. So um, I'm a little bit familiar with it. Uh, so, for example, um, MT cars has uh, a bunch of information about cars and models and information about each of them. So I was looking at the variable CYL, which is the number of cylinders. And if you want to know how many different types of cylinders um, there were in these cars and then how many of each type, we can use the count function. So we put in MT cars into the pipe and then we use count. And we can see that we have 11 four cylinder cars, seven six cylinder cars, and 14 eight cylinder cars. So it's just a quick way to understand a variable. And um, it also has like more functionality. Um, so you can do it with multiple um, 
multiple variables at once, which is interesting because it allows you to like sort of like sort by one var or like understand how many of one variable there are and then sort of like subset that. So you can see here um, I added on to cylinder um, also the number of gears. So we can see like we still have our four cylinder, six cylinder and eight cylinder cars, but then it's split up into how many four cylinder cars had three gears, how many four cylinder cars had four gears, etc. cetera. Um, so that is definitely helpful. And um, there's also a sort function where you can sort it um, uh, the opposite direction, essentially, instead of low to high, high to low. Um, and the name argument at the end um, just allowed me to make the top of that final row um, number of observations instead of n, um, just to make it look cleaner. And then the weight function, um, I was a little bit confused. So I did my, my best to understand it um, and put some, uh, put, put some examples below um, to, to try and explain the weight argument within count. Um, so essentially my understanding was that it um, is most useful if you already have a data set that you've done count on or that you've in some way organized once. So you can see here in this example, I made this little data table here that has cylinders and gears and number of observations um, into a, uh, a data frame called new cars. And then I'm putting new cars into the pipe here and I'm doing count. Um, and if we weight it by gear, we can see that we get like the full number of observations that were four cylinder. Um, so all of the all of the different types of gears added together um, and then same for six and eight cylinder. Whereas if we were just to put new cars into the pipe and only do count of cylinder, but not weight it, um, we just get that um, there were like three categories of four cylinder cars, mm -hmm. three categories of six cylinder cars and two categories of eight cylinder cars. Um, is it helpful? Uh, I think it is helpful. I think it's most helpful if you know already or if you can quickly determine from your data set that you only have a few different types of, of your variable. So like it was great for a cylinder where there's only like three different types of um, so like different cylinder cars, like a four or six or eight, um, because there's an appreciable number of each one of them, as we can see up here. Um, definitely less useful if you have a variable that has like one or two of a lot of different numbers. So I could, um, for an example of that, I put in the weight for the cars and you can see here that it just returns pretty much all of the weights and there's only a couple of them that have more than one. Um, of that value. So I mean, if you're looking for that, it could still be useful, but I definitely think this is a less, it's less useful if you have a lot of different unique values and more useful if you have um, several categories and you're trying to understand them better. Um, so so what, yeah, that's... Great, thank you. So what is one function we've learned that can help you identify and identify variables that could be useful on? Um, I am forgetting the name off the top of my head, but I can picture it. <laughs> yeah. So skim, skim is really useful. Um, so anyone, so great. Thank you so much, Natalie. Thank anyone you. Have, yes, so Jessica answered it cate categorically. Um, so anyone have any questions for Natalie? So again, great job again, and I will um, just make sure that you submit both the um, HTML and RMD files and I'll get them up on the website. So thank you both. Um, so that's all I have for today. So um, I can stick around for a little bit if anyone has any questions about anything. Um, and remember assignment three is due tonight, so. Um, again, thanks for sticking stick, sticking with me, and um, have a good night. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.